Hi, I'm Tab Schott, CEO of Doublehorn. Today I'm joined by Eric Heyman, CEO of Austin Asset. How are you, Eric? Very good. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining. You bet. Before we dive into leadership, uh, a little bit about your book and Austin Asset. Tell us about your path and how you arrived as CEO of Austin Asset. You bet. So I was, uh, I'm a native of Austin, which means okay. I didn't get very far in life. So I just stayed, <laughs> I, started, I started here and I decided yeah. to stay. Uh, but that also meant that uh, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I just lived in Austin my whole life. I thought this was a nice place to stay, but that at the time, the late 90s, early 90s, there were, most of the big jobs were in other cities. So when I was a junior in school, I did an internship at an accounting firm. And no offense to the accountants out there, I liked about 5% of the job. That's right. And so I went back to my senior year and thought, well, now what am I going to do? I didn't have a resume, hadn't gone on any interviews, and thought, well, that accounting thing isn't going to work, so now what? Uh, and took a personal finance class at the University of Texas as an elective to fill based on some guidance from a career counselor took the class and loved it and found that most people that were doing the job though were salespeople. So I thought, well now, well, now I'm stuck because oh. either I'm going to become a salesperson and go sell things for an insurance company or a bank or right. a brokerage company. Uh, but I love this idea of being a professional in the accounting world. So talked to my professor about it and she got me on a list of names that she knew of of people that were starting to do financial planning for a fee, like charging advice like a law firm or accounting firm. Right. So I called up the founder of our company and said, can I just come ask you what you do for a living? So like, you made you a really, cold call to him. Yeah, I just called him up and said, can you just tell me what you do for a living? Because I don't know what I'm going to do now that this accounting thing didn't work out. And he said, sure, come on by. So I met with him on a spring afternoon. And we talked for a couple hours. And I said, well, how about this? Next step, I'm waiting tables at night. Can I come into the office on my afternoons of class or on my off days just to watch what you do? <laughs> and then I was about to graduate. And my parents thought I was still crazy because I hadn't found a job yet. And it was, now the test was on, what am I going to really do? Am I going to keep waiting tables with a degree or not? <laughs> and so I went to him with a proposal and said, can you just pay me something so I can tell my parents I've got a real job and I'm not going to wait tables anymore? Right. And so he agreed to pay me uh, very little, but it was enough to where I could quit waiting tables. And so then I started working there and that was almost 22 years ago. Impressive. Yeah, Impressive. so the, the unpaid intern. So I started yeah. off just working for free. Then so. you rolled the dice, made a cold call. It's still there. That, that's, that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Let, let's talk about Austin Asset. Sure. So in my research, I saw the timeline on the website, you know, and we had a little bit of time to talk about it before before the interview. Yeah. Uh, but talk to me about Austin Asset and the, the evolution, because it's been quite uh, the evolution. Yeah, thank you. So we, we like I said, I mentioned uh, meeting the founder, and he was a one-person operation. So this was in a time when most people weren't uh, getting advice for a fee. They were usually going to a bank or a brokerage company or an insurance company getting advice around financial instruments and products. And he decided he wanted to build a business that was charging for advice and not okay. being paid by anybody else. So he had founded that business and it was primarily a, a one-person operation, a lifestyle practice, if you will, where he would meet with clients by himself and then he would do the advice and then that would be it. And he would charge for that project or that hour amount of time. So when I joined him, the idea was just to do a, build a consulting practice. Right. And when I met with him and we talked about what was possible for the business, we decided that we actually could hire other professionals to do this work, like a law firm and accounting firm, but it hadn't really been done yet. It was still a new concept. Locally or locally or here in nation, Austin. nationwide? Yeah, so the, the industry is, uh, as we were called, we're a registered investment advisor, which means we're, we're kind of registered with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, but we're registered to give advice for a fee. Okay. Different than a big bank or a brokerage firm or an insurance company. And so our clients pay us a fee for our advice and nothing else. That's the only way we're paid is for our advice. Well, that was a very new concept in the late 90s. Right. Uh, you, didn't, you had stock trades that were still over $200. You had people selling mutual funds with 5% commissions. So it was right. a very lucrative world for the investment industry because right. there wasn't much disclosure That's right. or transparency. You didn't have the internet to kind of go check on what things were. Yeah. So when I joined up with him, the idea was, could we build a firm that hired people that were certified in financial planning, a certified financial planner, the designation, and then attract enough clients that needed that type of work to where we could make a difference in their lives, but charge them for our advice, not sell them an insurance policy or a stock or a mutual fund. And that was the intent of the business at that point by 97 was to build a business that was a professional services company that would yeah. give advice around investments. And along the way, Austin's been a great place to be. Uh, yeah. Having being born here and staying here meant that there's a lot of goodwill that has been built by being in this town for a long time because it's still very much a small town feel. And that meant that we were one of the first to the market of doing that and then made some lists on like Worth Magazine and Mutual Funds Magazine as a top advisor. And that really laid the groundwork across Austin to get us in touch with people that were 
uh, giving advice at law firms or accounting firms and other professions where they would want their clients to have someone looking out for them. Yeah. So they would call us. So what do you, what, when you talk about going from roughly a 25 million to you're approaching the billion dollar mark, if I understood it correctly, mid eights, right? Yes. yes. Um, what's, what, how do you grow that at that, at that clip? How do you continue? Do, do you reestablish re the benchmark and expectation or do you actually find the growth strategy that gets you those multiples of growth? Well, I think the, the biggest thing that's happened for us is the, the transparency that's available to consumer was happening as our firm was growing. So as more people learned that they could get advice for a fee, we were growing our business. So it was a very much a parallel path. So as the firm grew, we found that more people needed the service or wanted the service at the time where we could have then attract the talent. Right. So when I got in the industry, you couldn't get an undergraduate degree in personal finance. Now there's over 200 colleges that will give you a bachelor's degree in personal finance. Right. So think of it as though the, the supply of people that wanted to do this job was growing as, at the same rate that the consumers were looking for. Okay. And so for us, it meant that we attracted a lot of really smart people and have those people on our team from different disciplines. Maybe they were in a tax right. field or maybe they were in an investment field or in a kind of a brokerage field, but found that they wanted to do work uh, purely for the benefit of the client and not for some other large company that was telling them kind of what to do like in a, in a yeah. big corporate situation. So we, we found a way to um, hire those folks and give them real meaningful service work for clients as opposed to hiring salespeople to go out and convince people they needed what we had. Right, and I was about to go down that path, the people path, the human capital path. Mm -hmm. Implementing a strategy in a professional services or an advisory is, is different than having a hard product or a sure. package solution. And as a CEO, how do you go about rolling out a, a strategy uh, within a firm like yours? So I, I, it, it's, it is, it's hard to put your finger on, okay, we're gonna design this water bottle a different way, and we're gonna market a certain way, and here's the label that we're gonna put yeah, on it. It's not it, a tangible thing. No, you couldn't touch it, and so in, in many ways it was, what was our burden? So it had to start with some concern we had or some burden or something that like broke our heart with the industry or with the, what the consumer was experiencing. So it was very much appealing to what was hurting in the industry or what was hurting the lives of our clients right. and then attracting people that, that wanted to service that and wanted to take care of that. So for us it was, what was wrong in the industry was things were costing too much for the consumer and they were filled with conflicts. So I might tell you that you need, you need this type of investment, but the reality is it's because on Monday morning at a sales meeting, and they told me if I sold five of those, I got like a trip to a, the Bahamas. A kickback. Right, uh, and so yeah. that was the state of advising. And so when we realized that we wanted to grow the business that way and kind of put our fingerprint on an offering, it was all about, well, it's, it's fee only, which means we're only charging you a fee. Right. It's objective because no one else is telling us what to do. And if we tell you that you should pay off your house, it's because you should really pay off your house. There's no, there's no disincentive no or conflict, conflict of interest. Of interest. Yeah, yeah, and so that yeah. was a big part of presenting yeah. ourselves in a lobby where in a, in a situation where we were fiduciaries, we really had to look out for what was best for the client, even if it wasn't best for us, because they were paying us for that level of advice. Yeah. And that was, that was a major differentiator. It's, it's more competitive now than it was early on, but- Would you still consider it a key differentiator? But it's, it's still a key differentiator, yeah. and most of our clients are coming from places where they're getting advice, but they're not sure if it's conflict-free, or if it's as objective as they want it to be, or if they're really advocating right. for what's best for them, or if it's what's best for the home office in New York or Chicago or somewhere like that. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about your book. Yeah, and and specifically when you get into leadership transition, and I can only imagine that 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 book helped pave the way to some of this growth too, because you get to talk about your real life experiences. Yeah. You know, going back to cold calling a one man firm, and then yeah. growing it to where it is today. So you've seen these. Uh, transitions take place and it seems like that you spelt it out in a book literally yeah you, yeah. you wrote the story yeah that's right it yeah. was it was very much uh, the book was very much a missional project it was not something I thought I would ever do it's not something I really had a plan to be a part of uh, we the founder started the company in 87 I joined him in 97 by 2007 we decided to design a seven-year kind of succession plan for him to retire out of the business to follow his own advice I mean he had built this business we we're advising clients Practice on retiring and exactly so it was he wanted to practice what he preached. So yeah. he designed this seven year plan. And at that point, it was all about executing the plan in really small chunks uh, strategically with our clients as well as with our employees. And by the time the plan was getting to its end, I was speaking about it and talking about it in public settings in the industry. And what we realized was there weren't many people talking about what it was like to be the successor. Most of the conversation was around, here's what it's like to be the founder and here's what I want and here's how I strike the deal and here's how I sell the business. 
but there wasn't much being talked about what it was like to step into a business yeah. and operate it or improve it or make strategic improvements. And how to best prepare. Right, exactly. Right. And, and so the, the book actually came up because a mentor of mine uh, suggested that I and a friend of mine, he's like, y'all should really do something with this. Like there's no one talking about the operational challenges, the financial challenges, or the emotional challenges of dealing with succession. When I talk when, internal, like it's uh, in terms of someone started a business and they're trying to find a team of people to take it over for them yeah. and, and build a legacy. And the book was really around how can we make it so that people know some of the steps to take. Yeah. So it so demystifies a little bit because people say succession planning, it's like, oh my gosh, that's so big. It's, I don't know how to do it. Where would I start? Why would I want to do yeah. it? All these kind of questions. It's gigantic. Right. And yeah. so what we wanted to do was write a book around you know, how law and accounting and architecture and finance deal with succession when so, the business was based on some person's identity. Right. Like a, not necessarily they weren't famous when it started, but by the time the business grew to a certain level, they had notoriety and they had respect and they had kind of people were Lots aware of who they will. were. A lot of goodwill. Yeah. And so the book was really built on... There's a way you can do this in a system. You can do this over time, but you do need some time. Like it's not something you can do in a year right. or two years. You can't remove one person and right. expect it's, it to work. Right. And yeah. so that's so the the book's been been a lot of fun because I got to do it with a mentor and with a really close friend, and also interview a lot of different experts around founders that had done it well, successors that had struggled. Yeah. Uh, some cases that didn't go as, as planned. planned. <laughs> yeah, and then talk about how that's part of the reality is that it's it's a it's a very emotionally weighted uh, conversation to have for yeah. someone to let go of something they built and turn it over to someone else. What was the process like writing the book? It was a bit like uh, going behind a restaurant. Like I think we go into a really nice restaurant and you sit at the table and the waiter brings you a beautiful menu that's and you pick, you pick your fillet yeah. and you order it the way you want it and they bring you your fillet. Well. Writing a book is like that, and I think we, we, we walk by bookstores in the airport and we see the, the fancy book sitting on the, on the table and it's the New York Times yeah. bestseller. And you look at it and go, oh wow, what a beautiful book, I wanna go read that book, you know, nice cover or something like that. Well, when we got into the idea of doing the book, it became, oh, this is how this really works. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to publishing that I didn't it's like understand. When you open the doors, the back of the right. kitchen, and you, the restaurant, you go to the kitchen. Wait, I yeah. wish I wouldn't. I wish I didn't know what was going on back there. You know, <laughs> and uh, one of the stats that they gave us was, uh, you know, of the eight million books that are kind of on Amazon right now, uh, fewer than eighty percent will sell a hundred copies to third parties, like unrelated people. Really? Yeah. So when you think of the books that are published, it, the barrier to entry is really low now. You can self-publish yeah. and things like that, but books are mostly published and bought for the author's benefit, right. not necessarily the audience. So it's used as a calling card now. Like it's oh. almost like a marketing tool. Yeah, that's right. And so when we did the book, we we're like, we all have day jobs. We're not doing this to start a new business. Right, right. Uh, and it was really purely for the benefit of the people that would read it. And so it was learning things like that. And the book was a lot harder to do and that there were all these uh, logistical things that we had to accomplish. Like we had to come up with a purpose statement for the book and who's the audience. And we had to design chapter titles with little summaries. And then we had to write a sample chapter. And then we sent all that stuff out to different publishing companies. And they would come back with feedback or ideas. And we finally picked Wiley as our publisher. And what was interesting was by the time we finished the book, that sample chapter that we wrote, we had to totally rewrite it because our voice had changed. Right. The more you dug in. As we more dug into the story mm -hmm. and we wrote the book and the, the language we used, that sample chapter was didn't even relate anymore because <laughs> it, our voice had totally changed in terms of how we structured the book. And so yeah. that was, it's been a lot of fun. And it's... You get to speak about it often? I do. I get, to, I get to speak uh, probably four or five times a year. I could, I could probably do more if I, maybe if I wanted to. But I have a day job still, and I, yeah. I love running this business. But it's fun to go do and, and have people reach out to you and say, I'm having this issue. Can I just spend 30 minutes just asking you some questions? And so I try and do as much of that as I can because it's, it's one of those deals where the successors, uh, when you think of the parties involved, so the founders a lot of times are struggling with letting go. Yep. The, sex, the successors are struggling just as much with grabbing a hold of it. Yeah. So there's this tension around, will you let it go and can I actually grab it and hold on to it? <laughs> And I think that's where, for both parties, there's um, how do you connect those two conversations is what yeah. we hope the book does. Yes. And so when people reach out to me, if it's a founder saying, hey, we really want to figure out how to develop the next generation of talent, how to sell the business to them, I can give them some ideas of what might be helpful to that audience, like their successor group. If the successor calls me and says, hey, I don't know how to approach this with the founder. I feel like I'm stuck. I don't know if he even really wants to let go or she wants to retire one day. I can give them some pointers on how right. to go have that conversation. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy yeah. that. It well, gives you're speaking me a, from experience. Too. It gives, yeah, it I mean, gives me a voice that 
I hope makes an impact in some of those other businesses beyond yeah. just our little business. So, let's look at it to 2019. Yeah. What, what what goals do you have out there? How are you going to go about achieving them? So for for us. Uh, as a business, it's very much around what's our impact look like? How can we risk our influence to make a difference? It's kind of like a big part of our theme. Uh, as, I, as I look forward is we've been given uh, this business in Austin. We're the largest employer of certified financial planners. It's an independent kind of fee only company. Yeah. So we have that great goodwill. But the question is, what can we do with that? What are we going to right. do to make a difference in this community, but also in the industry? So there's been a fair amount of conversations about that now because we're four years past the founder retiring. Uh, we're all younger. I'm the oldest. Uh, the model's owner. proven. The model is some, seems to be somewhat durable in terms yeah. of it's lasting yeah. for 30 years. And now it becomes, what's our voice look like going forward uh, in the in the business setting? And so for us next year, it's about more brand awareness. It's about more community goodwill and community involvement so that people know that we're a place where they can get advice, uh, mm -hmm. where they can go to and know that they're going to be taken care of. So in our world, trust, you think of, you can't sell them this and go, hey, you're going to really enjoy this piece of this bottle of water. It's this elusive idea of trust. Well, just trust me. Like you should, it'll be a great experience. Well, for us, you know, trust is built by certainly being very reliable. Like we're going to do what we say we're going to do, yes. but it's also delighting them. That's right. And so we're, we're really focused on how can we do that in a way that's different than what the, the bigger firms are doing where one advisor may have hundreds of hundreds of clients right. and, and we're much more focused on kind of a personal type. So. I want to wrap up with a mentor leadership question. Sure. Uh, how, when you, in your side your organization, you identify young up and comer, mm -hmm. um, whatever profile that may be. Sure. And, and some stick out, right? Some are shining a little bit more than others. Yeah. It's not because everyone does, does not have the potential, but some are just mm -hmm. at, that, sure. at that point. How, how do you go about uh, carving a path out for them that maybe can fast track them into more of a leadership role, knowing what you know, because you've been there before, right? Sure. You were the guy that made the cold call. Sure. You're the guy that did that. You, you, you can respect the time. Do you have a specific program or is it more about you just uh, building a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that person and, and really helping them? So a little bit of both. So for, in our business, uh, again, we're all planners, so this is kind of one of the sicknesses of being a, a planner is that <laughs> uh, we look at this uh, in, in very linear terms at times. And so it may look like for all of our employees have three-year development plans. And, and the idea is meant to say if the business is going to be at this point and one of our most valuable assets is the people, how do we ensure that they get to that point as well? Right. So that's something that we do across all the employees. Well, in fact, they have to get right. there to get the company to its point, right? right? So they're, they're, they're the biggest part of the company getting there. So that's right. that's kind of step one is having the three-year development plan. So in, in year one, it's very specific. Year two, a little less specific. Year three is maybe aspirational. But at nothing else, it gives them a track that identifies where they could go. So that's right. that's we're giving them an opportunity. So we're setting the development plan. The next yeah. is that... You know, twice a year, I'll sit down with all of them, uh, all the employees, and take them through some type of study or some type of book or a shared experience. And in those yeah. environments, I can get a glimpse of who's looking for more. Right. Like who's looking for a little bit more out of this opportunity? And that way, we, it's they're, I call them lead meetings. So the leadership, encouragement, accountability, and development. Oh, that's fascinating. And so the idea is I'll structure the meeting around like we just recently had took all the took all the employees. We went, we all read the Go Giver together. Okay. And we went through that, and I gave them a series of questions. Said, "Come prepared to discuss this." Some meetings were an hour long, some were two hours long, and some we had follow ups. But it's it's their way of me gauging. How, how invested are you in this right. process of developing yourself that, and how that helps the business? Yeah. So for I, I me, can only help you if you want right, to help yourself. Right, And yeah. so in our world, it's the, the triangle of kind of development is willingness, opportunity, and capability. Okay. And so I can create opportunities all day long. We can give you a budget or tools to, de to develop your capabilities, like your, what you learn and what you know. But the willingness is really yours. Yeah. And so, right. And so if, if, yeah. if twice a year we can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one and go through something together, a book or article or something, and then they want to come back for more and they want to learn more, then I know where to invest my time. Yeah. And I think that's, for me, it's, some of it's, it's uh, similar across all the employees, but then it's also the, the willingness pieces in their court to decide how far they want to take it. And so for us, that's, that's a big part of where I spend my time. Well, it helps you identify to, that person that pops up. Right. Because for me now, the, the funny thing is, uh, and I'll be 44 in a few weeks. I'm the oldest owner in the firm, but I've been there for over 20 years. So now I'm actually designing what the next generation of leaders look like, yeah. even though I'm young to be doing it, because we're writing this book about it, and then speaking about it means that I'm, I'm also, it's time for me to be thinking about those things too. Yeah, so I'm yeah. very much in the stage of who the next generation of leaders are in our business, 
And so I'm, I'm very much motivated to test that out. Uh, in terms well, of I saying think how with that 20 look. to 21 years, you're, you're, you've built the credibility. You can do it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for joining our C-Level chat. Look forward to seeing you next time.